Good afternoon, everybody. We will continue now with a panel on pr productivity and resource allocation from an academic perspective, which I believe um, it combines quite naturally with what was discussed during the morning session in the sense that several of the speakers, when searching for explanations for a better understanding what's, of what's happening at the macro level and productivity, made reference to efficiency in resource allocation, particularly with regards to factors. And this will be discussed next. And for this, we have the participation of Diego Restucia, Marina Mendez, and Carlos Urrutia. And I will be reading their um, CVs right um, next. The, their, um, I'm going to guess read their resumes and then we'll have the presentation. Diego Restucia has a master and a PhD in economics from the School of um, and from Minnesota and um, a degree from Andres Bello University in Venezuela since 2010. He's a professor of economics at the University of Toronto, Canada, where he was also an associate professor and assistant professor in 2007. He worked as senior economist at the Department for Research of the Bank of the Federal Res Reserve at Richmond. He has several um, published papers, including the size distribution of farms and international productivity differences, the evolution of education, and a century of human capital and ours. Marina Mendez Tavares is a visiting professor from the um, inst uh, at the ITAM. She has also worked as an al analyst for research at the department for um, research at the Bank of the Federal Reserve at Minneapolis. She was a research assistant at the Department of Economics of the University of Minnesota, and he was, she was also um, research um, assistant for Professor Fatih Kuvan. And she received a master's and PhDs in economics from the School of Minnesota. Before this, she had studied at the IMPA, the National School for um, Pure and Applied Mathematics and a degree in economics from the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Her, temp her areas of interest are macroeconomics, uh, labor economics, and public economics. Carlos Urruti is a director of, and a professor at the um, Center for Economic Research. He was, he's also been an economist senior at the IMF, visiting professor at the Department of Economics of Georgetown University from 98 to 2002. He was part of the part, Department of Economics at Carlos Tercero University in Madrid, 1998. He obtained his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota. Before this, he had studied his um, degree at the um, Catholic University of Peru. So now we pass to our round of introductions with Diego, whom we will remind that he has 30 minutes for his presentation. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. The research I'm going to present is, well, a bit different from what has been presented today. And I want to underscore the allocation of resources or the poor allocation in 
in, in resources and not within the sector necessarily, but within the different um, subsectors in sectors. I'm going to focus on agriculture. This research is very pre preliminary and it was done together with Dasso Alamopoulos at the University of York in Toronto. Before the very um, before um, speaking of the paper in depth, I want to explain the nature of 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 my work with relation to not the poor allocation of resources. I, I I don't w want to repeat this. Um, over and over, I'll just say misallocation. So uh, I want to read on advances made on the subject. So um, the, the idea is that the misallocation of resources among productive factors can help us understand the difference we see in aggregate measures of productivity among countries or economies throughout time. And this idea has, well, there's several variables but the idea, this idea has form, ha, has become a part of the agricultural sector. If we see the difference in income between rich and poor countries, we will discover that agriculture is a fundamental issue with regards to accounting. Poor countries are unproductive in their agriculture and they also spend most of their workforce on this sector. So from an accounting point of view, we need to understand why poor, poor countries are improductive is fundamental. So this is where the literature on misallocation has helped us better understand these differences in productivity and some of the work I did with Dasso previously had to do with um, misallocation in agriculture as a way of explaining low productivity. Um, this exercise is very difficult, determining what institutions lead to this poor allocation, but a fundamental part is that land is, is a very important um, sector for production, and um, especially in regards to, um, to, to, to this. And for this reason, I based this on institutions that may lead to a poor allocation of, of in, in land and therefore can have this repercussion. And I think the most interesting aspect about l recent literature on misallocation is that the notion has expanded to incorporate on dynamic effects and how productive units and how they invest throughout time, how a distribution of productivity well, is done. So when they were measuring the importance of misallocation, they were proving that misallocation, not only in um, its um, most, um, in its tightest definition, well, is important, but there's also, we also need to consider the mi micro um, factors and, and we paid attention to the difference between China, the US, etc. So this paper is trying to understand that these factors are ne not necessarily well alloc um, properly allo allocated. We'll see um, the misallocation of land as a way of understanding effects on aggregate um, well, in this paper, you can see it up here, I'm going to study land reforms. As a policy that has been very common in developing nations, and in principle, we're interested in knowing if these land reforms have positive or negative impacts on the economy. So what do I refer to with the redistribution of land? 
um, and this exogenous re re redistribution of land. These policies are done with a applied with a ceiling of land. In other words, the um, um, uh, farm can't exceed a certain size. So these policies tend to redistribute land from very large ones into to to those who are smaller. So. On many occasions, these policies go hand in hand with policies for the for for, for the redistribution of this through the elimination of sales of land, prevention of of auxiliary markets. Um, so these attempt for the operational scale to change. So more than a product production incentive, they, they seek to redistribute income. But in all practical sense, we want to understand the effects on productivity. This chart shows that how common these are in developing countries. And there's a very large variety in how they've been applied. In Latin America, they're fairly common. However, they have not been effectively implemented. Reforms have been undertaken. They should have changed land assignation, but only a small percentage of them are maintained. So some of these are if at places where land reform had an, uh, an, a strong effect. But what's important to see how these reforms generated a drop in the size of farms in those countries. These drops are even more interesting if you pay attention to the fact that what you would call the benchmark is that the size of, of farms increase with time, so productivity is increasing. So this leads to, to a reassignation of um, land to non-land, so the number of land falls, so then, and then they, they grow. So, so in developed countries, there's been an increase in U.S. Canada in the size of, of farms. So when you see a decrease, this is operating against um, a movement that should be a positive increase in the size of farms. Is that? Esta es la operación y Please save your questions for the end, otherwise we won't be able to um, stay within our time frame. Okay, I'll answer at the end. So it's important to understand in the context of the model that what's important is the operational scale. So if the distribution of property were um, an unequal, for reassigning land. This shouldn't have an impact on efficiency. It can have an impact on, on people, but the operational scale won't be distorted in this sense. So the fact that these land markets don't work well or are restricted by policies or institutions, this is where assigning this is, um, well, well, there's a distortion of the operational scale. So our question here is, what are the effects of these reforms on the land and the size of the farms and on their productivity? So I'd like to break, this, break the effects down between reassignation of land between, say, a very productive uh, farm and a, one that's not that productive, and also how, how they respond in time and how this can affect their productivity. So in this particular case, we will focus 
in the case of Philippines, uh, Philippines is a, a land reform that was very exhaustive and was fulfilled. It was a reform that truly um, reassigned or reallocated land, great amount of it. So we have access to microdata, which allow us to the, 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 to understand the between and between um, so to see the how they the farms operated before and after the reform. So we consider a industry model in which there, there's going to be a distribution of farms and we will add to this framework with the possibility of farms choosing their own technology and that's going to generate this within and, and behavior of the farms throughout time. So we're going to to adjust this model to data from the Philippines from before the land reform, and then we'll study land reform consistent to what happened in the Philippines and see the effect on productivity and the size of farms, and then the effect with other changes that were very important in Philippines in the Philippines. So I won't be able to tell you everything, but these are perhaps the most important effects. The first one is that land reform has a negative impact on the size of the average farm and its pr productivity. And in this model, it occurs through two channels, which are misallocation and the restricted sense, reassignation of land between different pr productive units, but also in the change in crop. And the second point is that if you pay Something that's common when you evaluate land reforms is that when you pay attention to land reforms, uh, you realize that it takes quite a while to implement them. And when you look at the reform before and after, the, there's a period five to 10 years. And in these 10 years, other things may have happened that affect the productivity. Therefore, it's very important to have a framework that allows you to the to 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 break this down so when we um when we break this down there are other aggregate um factors that can act in, in as a countermeasure to the reform the land reform was in 1988 a comprehensive ag agrarian reform program they set a maximum maximum limit a ceiling for five hectares for all agricultural holdings, and 64% of the country's farmland was redistributed. It was very important for, for this country. Before this, the average size was 2.85, and it passed to two. So there, there was an average farm size that dropped by 30%. What's important is that these five hectares, which is the maximum size, is one point is seventy five percent more than the average size of the farm. So it, it shows how restrictive this is, as you would expect with aggregate data and well this is census data but you can see that there was a distribution they they went they turned smaller the farms red bars are after the reform blue are before and what you see is that there's a shift in the distribution of farms to the smaller size particularly between zero and one hectares so so it's uh about the soccer field. Um, so there's red have moved to the left as well. In terms of productivity, aggregate data shows 
that there's an, an important negative impact in in terms of aggregate agriculture. The red, the black bar shows when land reform happened, and if you see that there's a positive tendency in terms of agriculture, it dropped after the reform, and it hasn't recovered yet. In the case of microdata, it we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at a micro subset. There is a region that's fairly representative of of of, of uh, what is produced in Philippines, and it's Bukidnon, Pro Bukidnon Province in Mindanao. And what's interesting is that they interview families. In all cases, they are farmers. This data gives quite a bit of detail on what they produce, how much land they have, land they have, how many people they hire for the harvest. And this gives us plenty of information to have a, a, a measure of inputs and outputs in the, on the farm. Basically, in Philippines, we divide between food crops and cash crops. Food crops would be corn and rice. Cash crops would be sugar. So these are mostly for export. Whereas food crops are for daily um, survival. So before the reform, a large amount of farms would produce cash crops, and that has increased. So I can't explain you all the reasons why th there's a tendency to a cash crop, but there's an additional factor that doesn't have to do with land reform, and which is being, which is generating this result. That, it, th that's why it's more necessary to have a framework to obtain what this economy had been if land reform hadn't existed. To see a difference between cash crop and food crops, well, food crops are, are, are smaller and less productive than cash crops. And for this reason, when we speak of reassigning factors and integrating more and less productive units, that's what we call misallocation. We're going to have an additional factor, which is uh, throughout time, if a, a farmer passes from a cash crop to a food crop, there's going to be a, what we call within uh, change in productivity because they used a new technology. What's the model? I have five minutes left. Okay, it's a model that generates um, a distribution of, of farms. So the model we're, we are going to use is a Lucas type model in which we have um, diminishing returns at a scale and that generates the optimal size of a farm. So what we're going to add to this typical model frequently used in this misallocation liter literature is that we're going to allow farmers to decide if they will produce cash crops or food crops. This is the production unit. It's a farm that has an operator and it has a productivity that we're going to call S and this manager for this farm is going to 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 have a certain amount of land and he's going to hire a workforce the production um, function is this one Douglas and this production function 
will differ from the productivity of the manager. The other aspects of technology are more or less the same. The former problem would be to choose the size of the land and the number of workers he will hire to uh, maximize his returns. There's going to be a fixed cost in production, and that, that's what generates the difference between the cash and the food crop. It's important to understand more than these specific elements of that in these environments, a farmer that's more productive, and there's no distortion in the economy, he will demand more land and produce more, he'll be more productive. So in this framework, when you have a farm that's very large, if, if there's no distortion, that's asso associated to the fact that he is a pr productive farmer. When we include distortions or will generate a reform that changes the optimal scale of a farm, then the size of a farm will not only have to do with the productivity of the farmer, but with distortions or institutional restrictions. Basically, the solution of the model is that an individual who takes a certain productivity needs to decide if he's going to work as a worker, if he's going to operate a farm, and if he's going to do so, will it be following the food crop or cash crop model? So what's going to happen is that according to certain um, parameters, we will have two thresholds that determine the fraction of people who will be workers and the people who are productive between these two thresholds will operate the food fund. And the workers, the people with a higher productivity than this threshold will have a cash farm. Let's calibrate this economy to the US one. So here are a certain set. We have a set of parameters, and another one will be chosen so the model can reproduce tar targets that may be interesting to us. So things like the proportion of workers in the economy, the proportion of farms that are cash versus food, etc. This economy generates a distribution of farms, which is consistent with data, and the same with the proportion of land that each of these farms has. This just to say that this model generates predictions that are consistent with the data um, imposed. So it has a distribution of farms that's quite um, uh, consistent with the Philippines. So let's impose a land reform that represents the land reform in, in the Philippines. So we're going to impose a, a ceiling, a maximum amount of land. And since the reallocation has not been completed, we will allow that a theta probability the farm would not be restricted, so it will not be enforced. And minus theta, that farm will have to be. to the maximum sum according to legislation. That is the land reform and some little things changed in the model that would put in a land reform that will be consistent with the one that was carried out in Philippines, in the Philippines. Give, give you the results on the average farm size. This in the model, we can see it on the impact.
we don't when we look at the data obviously we would have to split it but the idea is that the model we can assess a different kind of enforcement how this will impact on the average farm size and a farmer output per worker and if it is complete if we do all the reallocation that will be consistent with that maximum scale of land then it would imply that the average farm size will decrease nine percent minus nine percent in agriculture minus five percent so if we would restrict the, this there were some farms that were above those five hectares that represented 16 percent of the farms to reproduce those numbers we need a theta that would be one percent that is to say much more closer to zero than 2.2 so philippines they would that impact would be closer to this column to my right The other effect that I wanted to mention is how to break down this aggregated effect of how the reform impacted economy. It impacted economy uh, in different areas. First, we say that misallocation on the traditional way, as I was saying a while ago, that is the farms that were larger than five hectares have to leave those lands. There will be a change in the general balance that will increase the price of the land. And then the smaller farms will be renting those or leasing those farmlands. So that would be the standard effect that we call misallocation. But then we, we have the composition of the mix uh, and the fact that the food crops are smaller size that makes that reform will be affecting more the cash crops than the food crops. So this gives us a distortion on the occupational choice of farmers. So in general terms, if I wanted to break down how important is misallocation and how important is the selection or the distortion in the occupational choice, what we find is from the fall of 5% in productivity added in the agricult agricultural sector, three percentile points is misallocation. Um, two percentile points, that will be the distortion of uh, occupational choice. And to conclude, there are many things that happen. Well, the model is simple. And impose a reform, analyze immediately its impact. And we see the data in 10 years. It is impossible to know or difficult to know what the impact was uh, when it started. But throughout the time, there will, there will be many other things that could have changed. Maybe the non-agricular, their productivity would have risen. And um, if we see what happened in this economy, if we increase the productivity of the non-agricultural sector, let's say there is a, a growth in the productivity in economy. In addition to the land reform, if we compare the effect, this is a median impact of the land reform, and when we compare it to land reform plus an increase in YGAP or added um, aggregated productivity, this would be the, the impact. So just to show you the importance of being able to separate what is the immediate impact or the direct impact of that land reform. And to conclude, this is a work that intends to connect what this allocation on the traditional says to effects that could be like a selection or other distortions that could affect productivity and that would contribute to explain the differences of productivity amongst economies. There are many things that we would like to share with you, but we will have to extend this to a general way. Um, 
to include non-agricultural activities and try to understand as well not only the, the distortion between cash crops and food crops, but also in selection of workers in terms of the agricultural, agricultural sector and non-agricultural sector. So I think um, this is just a part. We are going to give the floor to Hola, gracias primero a Inés y a Carlos por invitarnos. Yo voy a hablar en inglés, pero no creo que va a tener ningún problema. Okay, so where Perdón. Pueden poner la presentación, por favor. Un, un momento. So this paper is a joint work with Diego that just presented and with Jose Maria. So first, we, uh, there is a large difference in GDP per worker across country and TFP, TFP plays an important role. We spend the entire morning trying to understand and try to discuss how to account to TFP difference across country. And uh, the literature so far, one part of the literature has shows that differences in TFP can explain difference in GDP per worker across countries because uh, of misallocation. So as example, if you have an economy with uh, distortions and we have a firm with a very low productivity but receive a subsidy, maybe this firm would operate in an environment with uh, uh, distortions, but with not operating an environment that has has not has any distortions. So, what we're gonna do? I, that's what I want you guys to understand: is that this presentation is a little bit more. The, the contribution is a little bit more technical than the previous presentation. But what we want to accomplish is to move it one step further in this literature. So, what we want to do is. We want to endogenize the distribution of TFP. And uh, so, uh, sorry. So what we want to do is that we want to endogenize the distribution of TFP. So the idea that we're going to do is that we're going to show, sorry. we're going to show that by endogenizing the distribution, Small differences in distortion can account for a, for a large differences in the share of uh, differences in the paper worker. So what we're going to do is that we're we are going to uh, we are going to compare two economies. One that we do not consider this uh, this effect of endogenizing. Uh, the TFP distribution to an economy where the, distribu the TFP distribution is exogenous. So usually in this literature, what we do is that we consider that the U.S. is an undistorted economy and the TFP distribution is given, is the underlying distribution that is given by the U.S. And what we're going to show is that by endogenizing distribution changes and uh, the effect of, uh, um, is, of uh, uh, distortional, distortional policies can gener generate different TFP distributions. So the bottom line is that we're going to show that with this model, we can account, uh, like in a numerical exercise, very simple numerical exercise, we can show that the difference between uh, that we can generate policy distortions that account for the entire difference between the GDP per worker between the Mexico and the US. But in the same framework, if, it, if we do not consider the endogenous distribution, we can just account for half of these differences. So that's what we're going to do. So the model, it's a very simple model. It's the neoclassic growth model. I'm going to show that there is some tricks because this is a continuous time model, but the intuition is very clear. So consumers, they maximize utility, they choose how much to consume and how much to save. They supply labor inelastically. 
There are two types of firms, incumbent firms, that exogenous, that the rate of exo the exogenous exit rate is exogenous, sorry, the, the exit rate is exogenous, there is entrant firms with endogenous entrant rates. There is government that just fix a policy that is exogenous, and the revenue, poli the revenue from this policy is given back to the government. So now, first we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the incumbent problem, and then I'm gonna go over for the key results of the paper. So the main, so the, there is one part that is very stunned in the literature, and the second one also, but the first one is that a static problem that firms choose how much capital to, to hire and how much labor to hire. Then there is a dynamic problem where firms choose how much to invest in, in productivity. So they can choose the rate of investment in productivity, so how much their productivities are gonna increase over time, okay? So now, we can solve this model, and we can solve the value function, and we can find the, 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 the brown emotion that characterizes how productivity evolves over time. So what is new in this model that I want you guys to understand that the other models in the literature does not have is that size, that in this model, size of the firm is given by the distribution of TFP and the distribution of the policy distortions. And as we can see, the distribution of size over time depends on four parameters. Mu z, that is the drift of the TFP process, and that's the main innovation because it's endogenous, mu tau and sigma tau, that are the policies, and sigma z, that is the, the variance from the TFP process. And what we can do is that, that it's also one of the contribution in the paper is that it's is very tractable, is that we can characterize invariant distribution. So here on the, motto, on the bottom of the slide, you can see that the measures of firms with characteristic log of S is equal to the mass of the firm and the density of the firms. And what is very important and interesting about the model is that we actually can find a closed form solution for the density. And it's follow a Pareto distribution, okay? And what is very important is that uh, this distribution is endogenous and it depends on the firm's decision and also on the policy distortions. And what we can know is that this uh, distribution depends on this parametric size and this parametric size is increasing in distortion. And what is key here is that when we bring this model to the data is that uh, we can perfect match the psi to, uh, to something that is observable in the data. What is, is the uh, Gini coefficient on the firm distribution, okay? And uh, we know that a Gini close to one is that when you have a lot of inequality. The US, that is the benchmark on distorted economy, the Gini coefficient is like 0 0.89. So it's very high because there is low distortion and a lot of inequality, big firms and small firms. And in this model, when we have distortions, psi is increasing, so the Gini decreasing is close to zero, and we have what? A firm distribution that is flat, okay? And we can see that as well in the Mexico data, when you look to the Mexico, like Santiago Levy has some uh, data on actually the, the distribution of firms in Mexico is much flatter than in the US. And another thing that we also can do with this model, that we can map the model to the data, is to characterize the firm employment rate as a function of distortion and also on the TFP. So now I'm gonna go to, I'm not gonna go, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the equilibrium. So the equilibrium is gonna be a balanced growth path and it's very standard, consumer optimized, firms maximized, there is endogenous productivity growth rate, free renter, endogenous renter, market clearing the capital in the labor market, feasibility and government budget constraint. And what is new is that we actually have an invariant distribution, and this distribution is endogenous, and it's the Pareto distribution that I show 
in the previous slide. So now that we went a little bit quickly over the model, I'm gonna go over and talk a little bit about what does this model can deliver that the other models cannot deliver. And uh, so usually in this literature, we consider the United States as the undistortion economy. So it's an economy where mu tau and sigma tau is equal to zero. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna compare, we're gonna calibrate the model to the US as most of the papers in the literature do. And then we're gonna do a numerical exercise and try to quantify how much of this extra channel that we are bringing by endogenized distribution is gonna help us to understand how different tax policies can actually generate differences in TFP distributions across countries. And that's what we're gonna do. So the, this is a continuous time model, so the data period is monthly. So. And the calibration here is pretty standard. This is the calibration of a neoclassical growth model. Like uh, the parameters on the top is from a paper from Diego uh, Lichet Rogerson, and the parameters from the bottom we solve by calibrating the model. So by choosing that there were model replicated these features of the US economy, but it's the first one is like the Gini coefficient, capital output ratio, interest rate, so very, very standard. So that's the main question of the, of the exercise. Can policy distortion generate the GDP per worker of Mexico? So can, uh, is, we're, are we able to pick a sigma tau and a mu tau that is gonna be able to generate the difference in GDP per worker between Mexico and the United States? And it's gonna also be able to generate Mexican firm size distribution. Of course, I'm a, if I'm playing with two parameters, I need two moments to to be able to discipline, discipline these two parameters. And what is important here to understand is that by fixing mu tau and sigma tau, I'm gonna generate an endogenous distribution of TFP. Because my mu tau here, it's endogenous. It's not exogenous. I'm not fixing the TFP distribution from the United States, adding distortions in my model, and be able to see if that my model is able to match the US and Mexico. Here, no, the, the TFP distribution is a distribution of Mexico. So in some sense, in my model, Mexicans, managers, when they decide if they're gonna invest or not, they are expecting to have a TFP distribution that comes from Mexico, not from the United States. And it's surprising. We do pretty well. So in the red dot, is that, I'm, the red, I'm not used to do presentations that I have to be like here. But the red dot that you can see there is the, is, is the, is the data. So how much is the model closer to the data? As you can see, we are able to generate all the difference between GDP per worker between the Mexico and the US by choosing mu tau and sigma tau. And we are also able to generate the Gini firm size to Mexico. All these other points that you can see to Mexico and the US are convex combinations of mu tau and sigma tau. And what we can see is that if you wanna do some cross count analysis, if possible, we could do by choosing different, different Gini coefficients and different GDP per workers and try to see how the model behavior. But the goal here is not to do that. The goal here is to understand how much can we gain by, uh, by adding the endogenous distribution of TFP. And now, what we're gonna do next is you see, okay, let's shut down the endogenous distribution that they assume that the underlying distribution, the TFP distribution is the distribution of the US. And let's see how much are we giving the same uh, set of tax distortion, given the same mu tau and the same sigma tau, how much can we generate of the difference in GDP per worker between Mexico and the US. So the first thing that I show here is that uh, this is not only a quantitative exercise, but actually we can show analytical. That's also one of the contribution of the paper that although we are talking here about a very complicated object that is the distribution of firm size in the United States, we actually have an analytical solution for that, okay? And we can see here that if you have two independent distributions <laughs> 
one distribution for TFP that comes from the United States that was calibrated to the US, and one distribution for the tax, the tax policy, the FTAO, that actually the firm size only depends on the distribution of TFP. So the Gini coefficient does not change by adding the policy. So by adding the policy, what we can do? What we can do is that we can generate some of the differences in the GDP per worker between Mexico and the United States. How much? Like half. But the Gini coefficient, so the distribution of uh, workers across firms is the same as the US. It does not change. So, and that's the key part of the, of the, of the talk. So, with endogenous distribution, we, we, just little, we just need a small distortion in tax policy, and we're going to have a, a bigger impact on, on differences in the people worker across country. And with exogenous distribution, these same tax policies are going to be able to account for very little difference. So in here in our small account exercise, how much is this? Half of the difference between the GDP per worker from Mexico coming from this, uh, uh, this standard chain of misallocation in the literature, and half come from the fact that we're endogenizing the TFP distribution. So the main message is that this is a very important channel that we should be taking into account. And uh, we can show also that by endogenizing distribution, firms shrink uh, twice in 20 years, and in the exogenous distribution in 13 years. And also, since we're here with INEHI, we would like uh, to have the opportunity that we'd like to have this data on firm size to be able to to calculate these other statistics and compare the data with the model, okay? So here, like you can see that firms are shrinking over time, and this is just one, one figure from CN Clean showing that actually for emerging economies, this is not a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prediction that we actually found in the, well, we actually are able to find in the data. So what we do in this model is that we develop uh, a tractable dynamic stochastic model. And, uh, and this model allows us to, uh, to force it. This model is very tractable. So the matching between the model and the data is very clear. You can actually compute it by hand. And the second, the most important is that we are able to endogenize the distribution of TFP uh, that other models in the, in the literature do not do. And how much this gives us is give uh, half of the, of, the, of, the, of the difference between the GDP per worker or the half of the impact of taxes distortions on the difference between GDP per worker and the Mexico and United States in this example. Okay, thank you.